Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Animal Behavior and Welfare Seminar Series of the CAFO Center for the Study of Animal Behavior and Welfare. First of all, I would like to thank you for the fantastic turnout. My name is Alexandra Hanna and I hold the Bermuda Farm Professorship in Poultry Welfare. And today, we are very delighted we have a very special guest with us, Professor David Meller from New Zealand. And Professor David Meller, he has a Bachelor of Science Honor Degree in Physiology uh, from New England University in Australia. And he has a big PhD degree uh, in the field of uh, newborn physiology from Edinburgh University. <laughs> and today, he would like to talk about the development of survival critical behavior in newborn mammals. The floor is now yours. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, and also, um, I'd like to thank the Guelph authorities and Tina and Kim and the whole support staff who set up this uh, really not very taxing um, <laughs> series of, of talks. Uh, they're not taxing because I really enjoy these subjects and it's uh, nice to have an opportunity to present them to you. Um, having a great time here and uh, we've just come from a session with postgraduate students in the poultry area and uh, I've really enjoyed that um, and I'm having a, getting a good opportunity to see uh, what is going on here. Just as a, uh, a, a brief background, uh, as Alexandra has already said, my first degree was uh, a BSc followed by a postgraduate year uh, for honours in physiology at New England University in Australia. Um, I then went to Edinburgh to do a PhD uh, in fetal physiology. So my first year of full research in, in fetal physiology was in 1965. And literally yesterday, uh, the last paper in that series uh, was published by the Journal of Pe uh, Perinatal Education, um, which is uh, uh, in human infants, where uh, it's the second of two papers on uh, kangaroo mother care, which isn't kangaroos, it's skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact between the mother and baby from immediately after birth in full term, but as well as physiologically stable, uh, but premature infants. So I was the runt of the litter of two. <laughs> and so I don't know if that has anything to do with the fact that I became very interested in physiology of uh, the fetus and, and pregnancy. Um, my twin brother is a psychologist and uh, he is convinced that he can remember our birth. <laughs> He believes he kicked me in the left buttock in order to get me out of the way because I was born first. Um, but he has a very good imagination. Um, <laughs> and uh, actually I think he could probably trace himself back to uh, the left hand side of uh, my grandfather's gonads. <laughs> You will see, before the end of the afternoon, we won't be discussing it much here, but afterwards in the next session, uh, you know, over, over chats uh, and um, snacks, uh, that uh, I hold the view that the physiological evidence is that the fetus is unconscious until after birth. And so that'll get you going. You can think about that while we're actually looking at awareness and survival critical behaviors in newborn and young animals. And there are a number of papers here. Uh, my interest in this topic uh, began uh, in 1967 during the second year of my PhD uh, when an eminent fetal physiologist was visiting my then ailing um, professor uh, supervisor who unfortunately was going senile. Um, so I was sort of really uh, grabbing this person and asking him all sorts of questions and I spent the whole morning grilling him with fetal physiological questions 
and in the afternoon he probably got a bit sick of it and decided he wanted to take the initiative. So he started telling me about work he and his colleagues in Yale had been doing on uh, progesterone inhibition of fetal movements and estrogen stimulation of fetal movements. And he introduced this, and I do apologize for my attempt at the American accent, but um, he actually, I can remember it as if it was yesterday, believe it or not, and it was 1967. You work that out, that's 50 years ago. Um, and uh, he said, Melor, have you ever wondered why a colt doesn't get up and gallop around in the uterus, but it gets up and gallops around in the paddock soon after birth? Now, I have to admit that I hadn't ever wondered that, but that is a brilliant question. And what it shows is that very simple question, questions can often lead to some very interesting answers and years of work. And I spent quite a lot of time in the intervening period between then, 1967 and, 19, uh, and 2003, um, talking to my fetal physiological colleagues all over the world, um, getting them to examine the question of the impact of uh, steroids and other things on the activity um, and, in fact, brain electrical activity of, uh, of fetal sheep, which uh, have been and remain the principal model for understanding um, pregnancy, birth, and the newborn, the fetal physiology and uh, the newborn, uh, for application in human clinical management of babies. Um, so there's a huge biomedical literature that we can access uh, as a result of that where the work has been done in sheep. Okay, now I'm quite happy to make these um, slides available as a PDF if anyone has an interest in that. So uh, the paper in particular that it forms the basis of this is this paper with Roger Lentil which we published uh, in 2015. So we'll talk about life-threatening hazards for mammalian young, then general developmental stages at birth, postnatal developmental milestones, and the onset of cognitive capacity to modulate behavior. And then we'll have some conclusions. Now, birth itself, um, my twin can remember this, I can't. <laughs> Uh, is a, an abrupt expulsion, really. It tests the neonate to the limits of its physiological capacity, um, and any impaired neonates, neonates are going to die. And depending on the circumstances, even really strong, fully functional neonates can die because they can be overwhelmed by the conditions that they have to face. Um, strong neonates in reasonable conditions survive. No, I, they, uh, they claim it took 20 minutes to get me breathing uh, after birth. So just imagine how intelligent I would have been if they... If I <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, <laughs> it can't have been 20 minutes. <laughs> I can tell you that. It might have seemed like 20 minutes, uh, but it, it obviously wasn't. So what's interesting is that the, the birth environment the ecological niche into which animals are born um, uh, brings with it uh, unpredictable variability uh, at different stages after birth. And as we'll see, uh, it, is, uh, the, it is the dam, largely the mother, that manages that unpredictability until the young are capable of autonomous activity and, um, and function. So the relationship, the behavioral interactions are important, and these differ um, on a species-specific basis uh, with the ecological niche. So let's just think about these um, species-specific maturity categories, birth site, milk, care, and protection. Now, um, you don't call it this, but this is the Mellor classification of neurological maturity at birth. Precocial doesn't do it for me because marsupials are precocial just as these cats, dogs, ferrets, etc. are. But marsupials are exceptionally immature neurologically at birth. Cats, dogs, ferrets, etc. are moderately immature and undulates, farm animals and guinea pigs and human infants um, 
are uh, neurologically mature at birth. Now piglets are sort of in an intermediate stage, not with regard to neurological maturity, but with regard to their thermoregulatory capacity. So here are some pictures. You can see a six-day Tamar wallaby joey, and you can see why we call those wallabines. <laughs> you have uh, three-day-old kittens, eyes closed, still deaf at that stage, and then a 10 to 15 minute old lamb. Uh, and you can see that it's beginning to get up and get going. So immediately after birth, there is rapid entry into the pouch of the mother with the marsupials. These others are born into burrows or dens or secluded areas uh, and other sheltered areas, which is um, managed, if you like, by the mother. And the mature ones are born, generally speaking, uh, outdoors with or without various forms of shelter. Of course, piglets are born in the natural state into nests which the mother will build and she'll, if she's got the opportunity, collect more than a, up to a ton of uh, material to make the nests uh, for her to um, farrow and produce her young. So uh, maternal nurturing and protection in the pouch, milk care and protection for several months, uh, just as I, well, I'll say that after I get to the next ones. Maternal nurturing and protection with the other ones is in the secluded birth site uh, where, uh, uh, for several weeks. Now, one of the interesting things about both of those groups is that the uh, newborns, uh, the newborn and young individuals, will not uh, urinate or defecate unless the mother licks their perineum and she swallows that. And you think, oh, yuck. Well, just to make you feel really good, you, you in utero were swallowing your urine for the last, <laughs> it's true, <laughs> for the last 50% or more of pregnancy because you were urinating into the amniotic sac and you were swallowing amniotic fluid uh, which contained your urine. So just don't worry about the mother licking the perineum of these young and swallowing it. And just think about this. It's actually an amazingly interesting physiological mechanism involved there. One, it actually sort of keeps the place tidy. Otherwise, the sort of the build-up of um, feces, etc., would um, uh, be uh, unhygienic. Um, but also, as the mother is, swallows the feces in particular, they go into her gut. Any antigens, um, like bacteria, viruses, and stuff like this, stimulate her immune tissues in the gut lining, generating antibodies which go into her milk, which actually then help to protect the young. Brilliant. Uh, consuming, the, uh, consuming the liquid, the urine, is very good too because it reduces the extent to which the mother needs to vacate that area uh, to seek water. In particular, we're thinking here about the middle group, the more moderately immatures. Uh, rapid bonding of the others to the mother uh, and they need to stay with her or at least find her uh, or go to her when she returns to their secluded spot. Okay, now development of sensory modalities, the different forms of uh, sensors. In all mammals that have been looked at to date, it more or less occurs in this order. So you have the somatosensory system, the chemosensory system, proprioception, that is the perception of where different parts of your body in relation to each other, the vestibular section uh, for uh, balance, auditory and um, visual, and hearing and sight come last. So the modalities present at birth the very immature, you've got mainly around the muzzle and mouth, touch, temperature, taste, smell, vestibular, but not nociception, proprioception, hearing or sight. In the moderately immature, touch, temperature, taste, smell, vestibular, nociception, but not proprioception, hearing or sight. And then the mature, all of them are present to some degree. Of course, they go on maturing 
after birth, and in these other ones, once they appear, they go on maturing uh, for some time. You see how interesting comparative physiology is. It's really fascinating. Okay, postnatal development of behavior. If we look at the, uh, the marsupials, I'm giving the example the Tamar wallaby. Um, one to a hundred days, there is continuous attachment to a teat. So the teat there, the provision of milk, is the substitute for the placenta in the other uh, mammals. A uh, hundred to 180 days, there is intermittent attachment and detachment from the, the teat. Um, but the, the uh, joey stays in the pouch. 180 to 250, repeatedly leaves the pouch and returns. And from 250, it's permanently out of the pouch. But it's not weaned for another 50 to 100 days. So it sort of goes up to mum and says, I'll just have a little. Um, <laughs> I was <laughs> once talking to someone, and, they, and I, I said, um, asked the question, uh, how, uh, what do you think is a good index that it's time to wean a newborn infant? And <laughs> he said, when they pull up a chair to have a suck. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sometimes takes me a moment to recover after one of those. Okay. <laughs> okay, postnatal onset of uh, hearing in the case of the, the Tamar begins at 125 to 130. Now remember, they're out of the pouch by 180, uh, in and out of the pouch. 140 for sight, and uh, they can see well by 180 and 160 days for proprioception. So they can actually stand un uh, unaided um, after that, that stage. So you can see that before they're going in and out of the pouch, they have all of their uh, sensory modalities in operation. Then we think of rat pups, pre-existent capacities progressively mature, Proprioception, in, uh, there's improved postural um, control and movement. Um, thermally induced isolation calls and retrieval occur between 3 and 14 days. So when the pups sort of, I uh, can't say exploring because it implies they know what they're doing, but uh, stray from the nest or the, uh, wherever the mother has them, um, uh, they then feel the cold and they call out and the mother goes and retrieves them and, and brings them back. And that goes on uh, until about day 14, pretty, pretty um, rigidly. Uh, and that is, when the, uh, uh, that is after sight has developed. And if you look further down about um, to the last three or four lines there, uh, and the isolation calls stop then so the mother doesn't retrieve them because they can actually get back to the nest through uh, smell, hearing and sight. That's all we need to think of there. And here are a whole lot of pictures of mice at different ages which don't give you very much information except <laughs> you can see they're naked to begin with, their eyes are closed. At seven days begin to open at 14 and they're looking a bit more sprightly and so on. I couldn't find anything that was more definitive and, uh, and clear, but uh, uh, those are the patterns. Then we have birth of lambs and other undulates. Breathing starts within five minutes. Uh, the lamb, generally speaking, lies pretty flat uh, until uh, that happens, but then onto its sternum with its legs tucked under. Uh, five to 30 minutes, they start trying to stand and teat seeking, locating the udder by smell, warmth and touch. And first sucking occurs often 15 to 60 minutes, but sometimes more delayed than that. Vocal interactions with the ewe, where the ewe lamb bond is established, occurs uh, during the uh, next um, uh, four hours or so, uh, and then to 36 hours the existing sensory capacities are going on maturing and the uh, lamb recognizes the ewe by hearing and sight after that. And then the lamb follows the ewe from uh, 12 to 24 hours after birth. And here we have the sequence going anti-clockwise. So 
birth occurring here, less than one minute. You can see the lamb is flat out. Three minutes, beginning to show signs of lifting its head and so on. Seven to ten minutes, um, beginning to try to stand up. And then 15, uh, 15 to 25 minutes, much more evidence of that. And eventually standing up and uh, sucking. Now, that one, um, until it starts breathing, shows no real signs of consciousness. And that will be a significant issue for us to think about um, when we start thinking about fetal uh, consciousness and newborn consciousness. OK. So the milestones. Now, if I, yeah, you can see each side of me, can't you? So I'm not standing in your way. OK. So the birth status. The Tamar wallaby and the Virginia opossum, for example, um, very immature. Their senses, uh, all senses are in place by 180 days in the Tamar and 70 to 90 days in the Virginia opossum. Uh, volitional behavior, they first leave the dam's pouch at about 180 days or 70 to 90 days. Now, the Virginia opossum, they've got about 12 teats, and sometimes you've got 13 or more born, so. <laughs> um, bad luck if you're the last. Um, and what happens is, around about 70 to 90 days, they all crawl onto her back and she carries them around for a while. So it's, uh, it's quite a burden. Um, then you've got rat pups, for example, uh, uh, equivalent to, um, in general sense, to kittens, puppies, etc. Uh, 16 to 18 days, uh, all their senses are there. They explore actively well beyond the nest and then depart and return at will by 18 days or so. And then the lamb, in less than 15 minutes after birth, locates the dam, sucks on demand, stays with and follows the dam. So we might even have time for uh, some of this sort of question about consciousness, um, because this is going really well in terms of timing. OK. So the onset of cognitive um, capacity to modulate behavior. And we need to think about key uh, developments in the central no nervous system. Now, cognitive activity relates to the cerebral cortex, the outside bit of the brain. And that is not fully connected or um, significantly connected to the subcortical regions of the brain until uh, different times in relation to birth depending on these particular uh, groups. Uh, in the um, uh, Tamar wallaby, it's not until four to five months after birth that they are connected. So that's talking uh, about the 180 day mark. In rat pup, it's around about two to three weeks. In the lamb undulates, it occurs uh, round about three quarters of the way through pregnancy. OK. So at birth in the Tamar, the brain regions are rudimentary, only about two cortical layers in the cerebral cortex. After birth, the brain growth is slow. In the rat pup, brain regions are uh, not particularly well differentiated. They're differentiated, but they're not particularly mature. And brain growth is pretty rapid. Uh, in the lamb, brain regions are very well differentiated and co cortical neurons are nearing maturity some weeks before birth. Uh, and the brain growth is rapid. So what we have is the cerebral cortex in place and having the capacity to influence behavior several months after birth in the very immature group couple of weeks, several weeks after birth in the moderately immature group, and before birth in the ones that are mature. And you say, aha, all that's in place, so they must be conscious. <laughs> I'm going to let that hang. OK. Now, we can gauge the operation of the corticothalamic connections, that is, the connections between the cerebral cortex and the 
subcortical regions of the brain by looking at the patterns of the EEG, the electroencephalogram, brain electrical activity. And we, I'm using that to mean fetal physiologists, not myself particularly, uh, have been measuring fetal EEGs in sheep, for example, um, since the 19, early 1970s. So it's a very well established um, approach. And uh, here are some EEGs, just to give you an idea. Some of them are uh, from different species. But if you look at the top line, that is an isoelectric EEG. This stuff is just background. Um, and uh, there is no electrical activity in the cerebral cortex. Then you have uh, stage two, which is short, low voltage EEG epochs. Uh, then you have stage three, which is where those epochs get bigger and the isoelectric phases between them are getting shorter and shorter. Stage four is where they all join up and you end up with mixed rapid eye movement and not non-rapid eye movement um, EEG patterns. Now they're sleep patterns. Sleep is a, a reversible form of unconsciousness in postmates. Uh, they remain in those, um, in those sleep-like states throughout pregnancy for reasons I'll describe. Um, so that's stage four. Stage five is where you get differentiation. You've got mixed REM, non-REM uh, before that, but then you get differentiation into non-REM and REM sleep-like states, and that's supported by information that is showing fetal breathing, fetal, ra fetal rapid eye movements and things like this with chronically instrumented fetuses that we've been studying as fetal physiologists for many decades now. Um, and then um, postnatally, uh, not postnatally, sorry, we haven't got to birth yet, uh, then you, the next phase is where you have variations between sleep and wake cycles so not only when you're asleep do you have the continuation of REM, non-REM cycling, but when you're awake, that disappears, so you're cycling between wakefulness and, and sleep. Now, the question is, where does birth occur in these various, uh, w in, in relation to these phases? Now, I say if you go looking for classification textbooks and so on for these phases of the EEG, they're the Mellor phases of EEG, they're not named that. I've just looked at the developmental patterns of EEG and these are pretty uniform uh, across all mammals who, that have been looked at. Um, and I've just differentiated them or shown differentiation in them to assist in understanding. So the very immature ones are born at stage one. The moderately immature are born somewhere between stage two and even stage four. Uh, the mature are born after the REM, non-REM patterns are very well established. Uh, and uh, then once they're born and once um, uh, they, don't, they don't sleep and wake uh, until after birth, as we'll see. Now, the point of this is that corticothalamic connections are in place once you've got REM, non-REM differentiation. So it's actually a marker for when the cerebral cortex becomes attached to the rest of the brain and therefore the animals have the capacity if they are conscious and in a situation where they can um, engage in behavior, they have the capacity to modulate their behavior by cognitive uh, input. And so this occurs in the Virginia opossum about two to three months after birth, in the Tamar about five to six months after birth. Uh, in kittens, puppies, rats, mouse pups, uh, rat and mouse pups and rabbit kits, uh, about uh, two to three weeks after birth, and within lambs, kids and calves in terms of expression of behavior uh, immediately after birth. There we go, we're gonna have plenty of time for discussion. That's very good. Okay, so. The onset of the capacity for behavioral flexibility and exposure to variable environments that require it coincide in these three groups. I think comparative physiology is absolutely fascinating. 
Very immature newborns are initially carried, nurtured and protected within the maternal pouch and moderately immature newborns are initi initially assiduously nurtured and protected in a nest or other secluded area by the dams. Assiduous maternal care meets otherwise fatal behavioural deficiencies of the young arising through their sensory immaturity. These newborns do not exhibit nor do they require a capacity for flexible behavioural responsiveness until they leave the pouch after several months or the nest after several days or weeks. I'll just draw your attention. Oh, you can't see it very easily. This is a Tamar wallaby at about 180 days holding Tamara Disha's finger, showing you that they're capable of um, standing up and propriocepting, if there's any such word. And you can see they're absolutely sweet things. I mean, ah, you know. <laughs> um, okay. The survival of mature newborns in their highly variable and unpredictable birth environment demands more prompt onset of behavioral flexibility. The pre-existent capacity for cortical subcortical interactivity at birth makes this possible in these neonates. The consequent rapid onset of cognitive activity in these neonates extends their behavioral repertoire and capacity to respond to environmental challenges. So <laughs> I just think that's absolutely amazing. I mean, it's, um, I mean, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? It doesn't matter that what you've got here, if you've got a clear demonstration of, in a way, the economy and integration and dynamic interactions of uh, development, neurological development and its capacity to support behaviours uh, when it's necessary. Um, now, I don't know how the, as it were, the coincidence arose and how it happened that wallabies ended up being so immature at birth and um, puppies and kittens less so and, and so on. But the reality is that we've got this integration uh, with uh, neurological maturity and those capacities. Now just to seed the point, well you say, well if that's the case, surely these fetuses, the, in the, at least the mature ones, are capable of consciousness in utero. Well, the evidence is that they're not. Well, they are capable of it in utero, but uh, that capacity is uh, inhibited. There are at least eight, you could say nine, in fact, at least nine um, neuroinhibitors that operate uniquely in the fetus. Uh, there is adenosine, which is a very powerful neuroinhibitor and can actually, when the, uh, uh, when the fetus becomes, uh, is short of oxygen, can switch off electrical activity in the, ele in the cerebral cortex within uh, 60 to, uh, 30 to 90 seconds, which was just as well, because, and it's a, it's a, a really important safety mechanism. Because you imagine, in my case, of course, uh, they claim, I wasn't breathing for 20 minutes after birth. Now, if I had had full-blown cerebral cortical activity f throughout that time, there's no way I'd be standing here now talking to you. I would have been brain dead by the time they got me breathing. But what happens with the hypoxia or, or shortage of oxygen during that after severance of the umbilical cord and when you have to rely on the onset of breathing is that the shortage of oxygen stimulates adenosine release which switches off the cerebral cortex and decreases its oxygen consumption by at least 95%, which is fine as long as you can reinstate it by about six to seven minutes. Because if you reinst reinstate oxygen supply within that time, then you don't have neurological damage. So, a very important mechanism in all mammals, sorry, all neurologically mature mammals uh, at birth. Okay, so that's adenosine. Then you have the really interesting situation that progesterone, produced by the placenta, is used to synthesize two other compounds, and you don't have to worry about the names, allopregnanolone and pregnanolone, which are very effective but not very useful anesthetics. So the fetal brain is synthesizing its own anesthetic, which also happens to be a sedative and an analgesic, 
which has benefits after birth. Um, so um, now this isn't this isn't demonstrated by saying, oh well. In the adult, these things have this action on the cerebral cortex and they're in the fetus, therefore they must be acting. No, 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 no. These have been specifically examined in terms of their activity in relation to cerebral cortical electrical activity. So this isn't just wishful thinking. This is peer-reviewed literature demonstrating that these compounds in utero have these effects. There's then prostaglandin D2, which is a sleep-inducing agent. Um, a placental inhibitor of cerebral cortical um, activity to maintain um, sleep-like states. And then you have warmth, buoyancy, um, and <laughs> something else. Uh, oh yes, um, soft tactile stimulation, the amniotic fluid cushioning and uh, generally speaking uh, the softness of the, uh, of the tissues even if as pregnancy progresses, they get a bit tighter. Um, OK. So this is what actually uh, keeps the EEG in this, these sleep-like uh, unconscious states. These are the factors uh, that can explain that. You can say, oh, yeah, but maybe you can wake them up. OK, we've tried that. Um, and so what we know from all the fetal surgeries that have been done is that there is no indication that the painfulness uh, uh, nociceptor input, that is pain receptor input, during surgery changes the EEG from these sleep-like states. Uh, sounds that um, are painful uh, and wake up sleeping newborns of the same species when applied to um, the uh, mother's abdomen uh, don't rouse the fetus. And finally, the, the sorts of stimuli that wake up the newborn, for example, oxygen shortage, um, cold, um, when applied to the fetus, um, the oxygen shortage actually switches off the cerebral cortex, quite the reverse from um, uh, waking them up. And cold doesn't rouse them either. I mean, uh, there was a, a model that was developed where um, uh, cooling coils uh, where cold water could be run through them were actually wound around the, the fetus and they uh, effectively, you're looking really, <laughs> looking really worried. <laughs> These can be challenging. Um, the notion was to duplicate birth in utero. Okay. So they wrap co cooling coils around the fetus, they catheterized the uh, trachea, uh, and they measured EEG and a whole lot of other things, and they cooled the fetuses down, which of course is what happens postnatally, uh, to see what happened, and they didn't actually wake up. Um, that was, uh, waking them up wasn't the purpose, but they demonstrated that they didn't. Now we did the reverse experiment, uh, but didn't realize its significance at the time we did it, where we were looking at heat production in newborn lambs. And the most effective way to cool lambs very quickly um, and get them back to the mother quickly uh, without them being exhausted is to put them in warm water at maternal body temperature and then cool the water down while you're measuring oxygen consumption. And that gives you with, uh, you can then uh, sort out what the heat production has been. You take them out dry them off, put them back to mum, and they're away for no more than 20 minutes instead of hours and hours, which used to be the way. OK, very interesting. Lambs born, up and around, having a suck from mum, or not if we were preventing them from doing that because we wanted them unfed at, at one stage. Put them into the warm water up to their necks <laughs> with a face mask on to uh, measure the oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. And within 30 seconds, they went to sleep. Okay. Now, if I'm being more sci scientific, I say they assumed a sleep-like state, but they went to sleep. Okay. <laughs> so, warmth is is actually very important. Now, all right. So they're in this sort of state, um, and uh, so what happens as you come into birth? Because here you've got all these inhibitors. Well, what happens is that leading up to birth. Uh, you find that fetal oestrogen concentrations rise. You remember I mentioned Donald Barron looking at oestrogen effects on fetuses. Um, and uh, that 
has widely activating effects on the cerebral cortex. And during birth, you have the, um, well, uh, don't worry about the names, but there are particular nuclei, the locus ceruleus, that has connections that go throughout the nervous system, which releases noradrenaline and uh, uh, increases alertness and uh, alert vigilance. And so you've got these two, in particular, strong um, neuroactivators. OK, they're not operating yet because we've still got the neuroinhibitors. The animal is born. It goes through a period of uh, hypoxia during birth. Um, and then it's born, umbilical cord severed. It starts to breathe. And once it has successfully established respiration, the oxygen partial pressures of its tissues go higher than it has ever been in its life up to that point. People talk about the first day of life after birth. Rubbish. <laughs> the first day of life is after conception, and I'm not trying to be controversial here. Um, so I talk, always say the first day after birth, because if the animal was dead until that time, it wouldn't be alive after birth, would it? So the first day of life is a nonsense. Um, so on the first day after birth, um, what, what happens is it starts breathing. You've got this a uh, uh, really huge increase in oxygen content, adenosine dives, loss of the placenta, so you're losing the source of uh, allopregnanolone, pregnanolone, the placental inhibitor goes. You've also got cold, gravity, um, hard surfaces, the mother's attention, changes in hearing and sight as stimuli for waking them up to overcome any residual effects of persisting inhibitors, and they get on their way. So um, here we have this really interesting situation about um, the connection between neurological maturity and the birth uh, niche. Uh, and we also have this other very interesting situation in those that are neurologically mature before birth, having them unconscious until after birth. <laughs> 